So we've been speaking about compact topological spaces. And one of the things that we proved is that if you have a finite collection of compact topological spaces, and you form their product with the product topology, then that product is again a compact topological space. Today what we're going to learn is that that's true even if the family of topological spaces that you're taking is infinite. This is called the Tikhonov theorem, and whereas the statement about finite products was relatively easy to prove, the Tikhonov theorem is hard to prove. In particular, the Tikhonov theorem requires the use of the axiom of choice. The particular form of the axiom of choice that we're going to employ is called Tukey's lemma. This is a lemma that's actually equivalent to the axiom of choice, but it places the axiom of choice in a form that makes it very useful for us in the course of proving Tikhonov's theorem. The idea is that we're going to look at families of sets. So these are collections whose elements are themselves sets. And we're going to be interested in those families with the property that being an element of that family, let's call it F, being an element of that F is a condition on the finite subsets of your given set. That is, a family F of sets will be said to be of finite character if and only if the following two conditions are equivalent for a set S. First, that our S is actually contained in F, is an element of F. And second, that every finite subset is an element of F. So being of finite character means that the condition, whatever it is, to be an element of our F is really just a condition that involves the finite subsets of our S. Okay, so now what does Tukey's lemma say? Tukey's lemma says that every non-empty family of sets that is of finite character must contain a maximal element with respect to inclusion. So that maximal element that's going to be an element with the property that if you added any other element to it, then that set would no longer be a member of my family. What Tukey's lemma says is that if you have a family of sets such that the condition to be in that family is something that is determined by the finite subsets of your set, then that family must contain a maximal element with respect to inclusion. So this seems a little abstract, but let's see it in a concrete example. If we take a vector space V over a field, that vector space will have to have a basis. That's an easy theorem to prove when the vector space is of finite dimension, but when the vector space is infinite dimensional, we need some tool like Tukey's lemma. So here's how the proof goes. You first start off by looking at the family F of linearly independent sets of vectors. So this is a family of sets, and what does it mean to be an element of this family? It means that you're a set of vectors with the property that you're linearly independent. That is to say, if you take a finite collection of elements of your set, and you take some linear combination that gives you zero, then all of the coefficients that you took in that linear combination had to be zero. So I'm going to take the collection of linearly independent sets of vectors. That's a family that I'll call F, and by definition that family is of finite character. The question of whether or not a set is an element of F is a question about the finite subsets of that set. So since the family is of finite character, it follows that F here has a maximal element, B. It might have many different maximal elements, but I only need one for my purposes. So it has a maximal element called B. And what does that mean? That means that if I add a single vector to this B, then I'll produce a family that is no longer linearly independent. If you unpack that, that precisely means that B is a basis for my vector space V. 
That is to say, every element of V can be written as a finite linear combination of elements of B. Okay, let's now put Tukey's lemma to work to prove a surprising theorem called the Alexander subbase theorem. If I have a topological space and I have a subbase for that topology, then certainly if X is compact, then every open cover consisting of elements from that subbase will have to have a finite subcover. The Alexander subbase theorem says that the converse is also true. That is, if I have a topological space X and I have a subbase for the topology A, then if every open cover consisting of elements of A only, if every such open cover has a finite subcover, then X is compact. In other words, if I'm working relative to a fixed topological space with a fixed subbase, then I could call this open cover with this property subbasic. And what we're learning is that X is compact if and only if every subbasic open cover has a finite subcover. So this is saying that if you have a topological space that comes to you with its subbase, then you can check compactness by only considering open covers coming from that subbase. This sounds too strong, but in fact it's true, and we're now going to prove it. So we need a couple of words to make our argument clear. And so we're going to introduce a couple of new bits of terminology. So let's call a family of open sets of X inadequate if it fails to cover X. So an inadequate family of open sets is one that just simply doesn't cover X. Now, there are other families of open sets that we also need to contemplate. We're going to call these skimpy. These are the families of open sets that have the property that every finite subset of them is inadequate. So of course if W is a finite collection of open sets, then it's skimpy if and only if it's inadequate. Let's look at a couple of examples to get used to this terminology. First, if I contemplate the family of open intervals from n to n plus 1, where n is some integer, say, then this is an inadequate for the topology on the real line. Why is it inadequate? Well, it's inadequate because, say, the number 6 is not covered by this. This family simply fails to cover R, and therefore it's inadequate. If, however, I take the ball of radius 1 centered at the various integers, then this family is covering. This covers R. So it's not inadequate. However, it is skimpy, because if I take only a finite collection of these, then I won't have covered R anymore. So this family is skimpy, but not inadequate. So the fact that I found a family that is skimpy, but not inadequate, is the fact that R is not a compact topological space. A topological space is compact if and only if every skimpy set of open sets is actually inadequate. This is the kind of contrapositive of the usual definition that we've seen of compactness. Okay, so we have these words skimpy and inadequate, and our assumption is going to be that the subbase A has the property that every skimpy subfamily is inadequate. If we have a subfamily of our subbase, and if that subfamily is actually skimpy, so that every finite subset of this fails to cover, then the whole thing fails to cover. Okay, so our assumption 
is that every skimpy subfamily of A is inadequate, and we need to prove that every skimpy family of open sets whatsoever is inadequate. That will prove for us our Alexander subbase theorem, because that will then prove that our X is compact. Okay, so to do that, let's look at the collection of all the different skimpy families of open sets. Let's call that set S. So S is a family of collections of open sets, and those collections of open sets are all skimpy. That is to say that no finite subset of those collections can cover my X. So by definition, S is of finite character. So S is the kind of set to which we can apply Tukey's lemma. And that's just what we're going to do. What we need to prove is that every W in S is inadequate. What happens? Well, if I have W1 contained inside W2, and if W2 is inadequate, that is to say it fails to cover X, then W1 certainly can't cover X, so W1 will be inadequate as well. In other words, if I apply Tukey's lemma to my S, I'll get some maximal elements of my S, and if I prove that all of those are inadequate, then I'll have proved that everything in S is inadequate, and I'll be done. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pass to maximal elements of our S, and we're going to show those are inadequate, and then because of this fact here, that will imply that in fact every element of S is inadequate, which is what we need to do. Now think about this for a minute. If we're saying that you're an element of S, that means you're skimpy. That means you don't have a lot of open sets. In particular, no subset of you that's finite is sufficient to cover my X. On the other hand, we're going to take the largest of these small sets that we can. We're going to choose maximal families that are skimpy. So they're as big as they can possibly be while still being skimpy. Okay, so let's take one of them, W. And let's notice that if I intersect W with the subbase A, then I'm going to get a subfamily of A that is definitely still skimpy. But by assumption, every subfamily of A that's skimpy is also inadequate. So W intersect A is inadequate. In other words, if I take the union of the elements of W intersect A, I won't get all of X. The elements here do not suffice to cover X. So W intersect A is inadequate, and what we wanted to show is that W itself is inadequate. So what we need to prove is that if I union all of the elements of W together, then I'm going to get something that's contained in the union of all the elements of W intersect A. Notice that the reverse inclusion is automatic, because after all, W intersect A is contained in W. But the thing that we need to prove is this inclusion here. Now that seems quite surprising. And it critically is going to use the fact that W is maximal. So this maximality of W, what does it mean? It means that if I add a new open set to my W, then it will no longer be skimpy. That is to say, if I add a new open set V to W, then I'll be able to take that V along with a finite collection of things that are already inside my W and produce an open cover of X. That's what this maximality ensures. So to prove this statement here, we need to understand how the subbasis A relates to my family W. And here's the key thing that we need to understand. If I have a finite collection, V1 through Vn, of open sets of X, and if I intersect them to get something that is contained in an element of W, 
then one of these actually had to lie in W to begin with. That's how big this maximal W really is. It's so big that if we intersect a finite collection of opens and get something that's simply contained in an element of W, then one of those had to lie in W itself. That's an incredibly strong sentence, but it's true, and here's why. Well, suppose not. That is to say, suppose that it were the case that none of these were an element of W. So we're going to use the maximality of W to contradict the fact that W is actually a skimpy family. So by the maximality of W, when I include VI into W for every I, I'm going to get a family that's no longer skimpy. That is to say, I can find a finite list of things in VI union W that will cover my X. So let's take that list. I'll take VI and I'll take UI1 through UIMI. And together that will be a finite cover of my X. And I can do that because I know that if I take W and add on anything, I'll have to be non-skimpy. Okay, so if I do that, then I have myself a nice cover and I have that for every single I. And so now I can assemble all of these. I can take all of the U, I, K's and union them all together and union that with the intersection of all my V, I's. This is still just a finite union of things. And this finite intersection of the V, I's, remember, is assumed to be contained in an element of W. So X is certainly going to be equal to U union the intersect of all these things. This is a finite cover of X consisting of elements out of my W. But that contradicts the fact that W is supposed to be skimpy. So that now shows that any finite collection of open sets that intersects to a subset of an element of W must include among its number an element of W. This is a surprisingly strong fact, but it's a critical consequence of the maximality of our W. And it's going to be the key thing that allows us to prove that the intersection of W with A, when I union all of those things together, is going to contain the union of all of the elements of W. In other words, if I have a point of an element of W, then that point will also have to be an element of some element of W intersect A. So let's prove that now using this key digression that we've seen. So suppose that I have an element of W and I have a point inside it. Well, because I have this subbase A, I know that I can take a finite family of elements and intersect them together to get a subset of U that contains my X. I can get an open neighborhood of my X that is completely contained in U. So this U is an element of W, so by this digression involving the maximality of W, I see that one of these VIs actually has to be in W. By assumption it was in A, and now it's also in W. So now I've got an X that lies in a VI, which is in W and A. And so that means that every point of this union is actually a point of this union. That's what I wanted to prove. To really emphasize what a bonkers theorem this is, let's think about proving that the closed interval from 0 to 1 is compact. If you remember, the original proof that we had of this involved looking at the sort of initial segments of the closed interval that were covered by a finite family and then seeing that it had a supremum and sort of conducting a little argument. Now let's prove it again using the Alexander subbase theorem. If I think of this closed interval, then it has a subbase consisting of, well, half open intervals from 0 to b and half open intervals from a to 1. This is a perfectly fine subbase of this. 
And if I have an open cover consisting of these sub-basic opens, then I can easily extract a subcover which just has two elements in it, zero to some b and a to some one. And I just have to make sure that b is strictly greater than a. So that means that every open cover of a has a finite subcover, and so zero one is compact. The Alexander subbase theorem just ate this problem for breakfast. Let's use it to eat another problem for breakfast, which is the question of the product of compact topological spaces. And this is our friend the Tikhonov product theorem. So here we have a family of topological spaces, each of which is compact, and we're going to form the product of them. This is probably going to be some giant infinite product. And we want to see that the result is compact, and we want to use the Alexander subbase theorem. And that's a good idea because we know that the product topology has a nice subbase. What is that subbase? That subbase consists of the inverse image of the various opens of the x alphas under the projection maps. You can think of these as kinds of strips inside the product. And so now let's apply the Alexander subbase theorem to this subbase. What do we want to show? We want to show that every skimpy family, W, that's contained in A is actually inadequate. So we're going to take a skimpy subfamily of A, and for every alpha in our indexing set lambda, we're going to let W alpha be the sets of open subsets of X alpha such that when I take their inverse image along the projection, I get something that lies in my W inside my skimpy subfamily. So my W consists of things in A, the things in A are all of this form, inverse images of opens from X alphas. And my W alpha is going to consist of those opens inside X whose inverse image under the projection map is contained in W. Okay, so what's true about W alpha? W alpha is certainly going to be skimpy. But each X alpha by assumption is compact, so that means it's inadequate. That is to say, W alpha fails to cover X alpha. So I can choose a point, X alpha, that is not in the union of the elements of W alpha, but is nevertheless in X alpha. And well, heck, I can do that for every single alpha in lambda. And so that now gives me a point of the product, X alpha over alpha in lambda. And no coordinate of this is in the correct place. None of them are covered by the corresponding W alphas. That means that this element of this product is not covered by the elements of W. In other words, our W is inadequate. So the Tikhonov theorem says that the product of any family of compact topological spaces is again compact. Let's see this in some examples. Well, to begin with, suppose that I have a family of any size, lambda could be as big as you like, but each of these X alphas is a finite topological space. Maybe it's discrete, maybe it's indiscrete, maybe it's quite complicated. It doesn't matter as long as they're all finite. This product will be compact. Here's another example of an even more interesting kind. Let's take a topological space X, any old topological space you like, and let's look at the set CX of continuous functions from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1. So we're simply going to look at the set of all these guys. And now let's do something very strange indeed. Let's look at the product over all continuous maps from x to 0, 1 of 0, 1 itself. So this is an infinite product of closed intervals. Now this with the product topology is a compact topological space. Furthermore, we have an interesting map. Let's look at this interesting map. This is a map that's going to go from our x 
to the product of all of these closed intervals. One for every continuous map from x to 0, 1. And what does this map do? It's going to carry a point of x to, well, something in this set of maps. So that has to be a map from cx to 0, 1. So if I take a continuous map from x to 0, 1, I can take that x and evaluate f on x. So this map here could be called evaluation at x. And this is a map, and it's a continuous map. Why is it continuous? Well, I'm taking a map into a product of topological spaces. So that map is going to be continuous if and only if each of its components is continuous. But what does a component look like? A component carries x to 0, 1, and it carries little x to f of x. In other words, each component is an f from c of x, but c of x, remember, is the set of continuous maps from, zero, from x to 0, 1. So that means that this map lambda, this map is a continuous map. And it's a continuous map from x into this product topological space, which by Tikhonov's theorem is compact. So that lets us do something very exciting which is the following, I can take the image of x under this map and I can close it up in the topology. This is a closed subset of a compact topological space, namely this one right here. And so we end up with a compact topological space, which is related to our original x. This is called the stone check compactification. of our topological space x. This is a remarkable construction. It's taking our x and it's putting it inside a larger topological space, which is necessarily going to be compact. In fact, it's universal with the property that it is compact. That is, if x is compact, then you didn't do anything when you did this process. x is already homeomorphic to b of x. And what does that mean? That means that this lambda here, this map lambda that goes from x to this product, already gives a homeomorphism between x and its image. Indeed, if x is already compact, then I'm mapping a compact space to a compact Hausdorff space in a continuous way, and so that means it's already going to be closed. And it's going to be injective, that's just a little check that you can make for yourself, and so indeed it's going to be a homeomorphism. Okay, so if x is compact, then you didn't do anything by this process. But if I take another compact topological space, y, and I take a continuous map from x to that compact topological space, y, then it turns out that there is a unique continuous map from beta of x, this stone check compactification of x, into y, such that when you precompose that map with your lambda, you get your original map f. That is to say, if I've got some random compact topological space y, and I take my x and map it to it via a continuous map, then there exists a unique extension of that map to the compactification, the stone check compactification, which I'll call f bar. And it's an extension in the sense that if I take lambda and then f bar, then I'll get f.